from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, you know, about um, 10 years after A Wrinkle in Time was published, Madeline wrote the first volume of her memoirs, which ran to four volumes. That was The Circle of Quiet. And she began to describe um, first her growing up and then her, her married life and her life as a parent and eventually even grandparent. And um, much of those books are based on the truth but are not um, identical with the truth. Um, and she was, as someone said uh, to me, um, she was a storyteller. She was always looking for the story. And if the truth got in the way, the factual truth, she didn't let it <laughs> for very long. Uh, and as uh, Anita is suggesting, um, sometimes this became a problem within her own family. Uh, and there was one incident of her daughter as a grown woman being at a convention and being uh, accosted by uh, a, a convention goer who said, oh, um, that was such a fascinating thing that you did as a little girl. And, and the daughter uh, replied, uh, well, actually, I never did that. And, um, and then this other per the stranger said, oh, well, of course you did. I read it in your mother's memoir. <laughs> and the daughter replied, well, remember, my mother is a fiction writer. But she said, oh, no, no, I, I meant to say that um, I read it in the memoir. And then the daughter replied, and I meant to say that she is a fiction writer. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this sort of sense of recycling and recrafting the past um, that uh, in some ways was Madeline's way of um, wanting to make the world right for everyone, but on a personal level, it sometimes uh, led to conflict. Yeah, she's sort of like the happy medium in Wrinkle in Time. You know, she doesn't really want to look at the dark story. She wants to look at the happy story, and she recast it. Um, just maybe a couple of words from each of you about you know, why this book? Why do you think this book speaks so, has stayed in print so long, has been around so long, speaks so much to you? And then we'll get one of these mics down on the floor and we'd love to have questions from you. But also if you have testimonies about Wrinkle in Time um, in your own life, we'd also love to hear that. So why this book and why was it so compelling? Um, well, definitely Meg. And this idea that you can be an imperfect person, you can be bad at things, bad at school, bad at, like, not have a social life, um, and still save, save the universe, basically. I think that's why it's, it's still so popular today, because that's timeless. And I, think, um, I think of it um, in connection with a book that bears no obvious resemblance to it, which is um, Good Night Moon, that book that lots of people read to one and two-year-olds at night. Um, the great green room of that book is full of everyday things like clocks and socks, but it also has the moon and the stars, and it has um, the world of imagination in the, in the nonsense rhymes, like the cow jumping over the moon that it mentions. And I think in the same way, A Wrinkle in Time starts with the ordinary and of our you know, domestic life that all of us can recognize is real. The problems that a, a outsider girl has with bullies at school, things like that. But it plays out the drama that unfolds um, with her uh, relationship to her father and her brother on the cosmic scale. So I think for a young reader, it's a book that you can relate to uh, on a personal level. But it also offers this possibility of stretching your imagination as far as the imagination can possibly go. So it's a great um, opening up kind of experience that uh, young people or readers really of any, of, a, of any age, I think, look for uh, in literature. And I think you add to it that sense that you as a young person can make an enormous difference in the battle for good and evil going on for the world. You know, that it, it, this is what J.K. Rowling is, of course, going to do in Harry Potter many years later, but you are the one who can affect the future of the universe. It comes back to you. You can make that difference. And that's a very powerful message for a 10, 11, 12-year-old who might pick up this book. Okay, we have a little equipment. Um, if I need an, somebody who's tech savvy, because we need to get one mic down on the floor. Um, and then you are welcome to come and get questions. All right, so. Do people, people know to ask questions? So 
So it's going to be what, here? This, this mic here. Okay. Would anybody like to ask a question or make a comment? Yeah, yeah. it'd be better with the mic. Thank you so can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm excited to read the graphic novel. And Anita, I love your book about the 100 great reads, and that was great. And my question is actually for Mr. Marcus. What, do you, what did you make of that New Yorker article five, six years ago that was really devastating about her and kind of? It's actually um, one of the many themes that runs through my book, because several people who were close to her comment, commented on it. And the author of the article also speaks about it. She, she was somebody that I interviewed too. I was very put off by it um, at the beginning when I first read it. Um, then I, said, I began to know more about uh, Madeline's life. I began to see that there was quite a bit of truth in it. Um, what I found objectionable was that she published it in Madeline Lengel's lifetime. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think Madeline Lengel was a truth seeker. So I th And the author of the article felt that she wanted an opportunity to explore the complexity of her life, almost as if these memoirs that she had written had become a kind of trap uh, where she had created this ideal picture for herself that she was stuck with. Uh, and she was looking for a chance to, to talk about the, the gray areas. But I don't think it should have been published in her lifetime as it was, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I first read A Wrinkle in Time, let's see, 10 years after it. No, I was 10. And uh, the thing is, we all say cliché, it comes back and back as you reread a book and you see where it is. But one point that I always found interesting for me is I read it in college, uh, again, just to pick it up. And I had this subtle thought. I don't know if you even care to comment on it. I don't even, <coughs> excuse me, I don't even know if it's worthy of comment. But with so many people reading it, and then you saw this feeling of the 60s of kind of fighting for justice and, and you know the outsider and the idea of mind trapping and I mean it was almost like she was anticipating the future and then you return again I just read it to my nephew and of course it's a different world it's a different place and, and you know you were saying why classic and I suppose it's just because it speaks to you once and then it speaks to you differently but it continues to speak to people at every age so just that idea of you know if any of you care to comment on on the broad impact of society. We talk about it on, 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 re, you know, on individual readers, but that broad, broad impact, again, of why it would last and how does it speak, which it does. I mean, it's amazing. How does it speak to a 21st century who leaves his or her iPad or maybe reads it on the iPad and comes back? Um, well, I mean, you know, in terms of how it impacted children's literature, so in that sense, society, um, it came out within a year of The Phantom Tollbooth, another work of very different kind of work of fantasy. Within a few years, um, Lloyd Alexander, Susan Cooper, and other fantasy writers were launching their careers. So it really helped um, uh, make a place in the literature for young people uh, for the literature of what if, the literature of imagining um, alternate possibilities for the world. And this, of course, against the background of the Cold War and the fear of um, you know, nuclear annihilation, where people were starting to think, maybe we do need to imagine a different world, because this one is so um, much headed for destruction. So I actually think that's why fantasy finally uh, took hold in this country. We were up against such an extreme situation, and one that, in fact, Wrinkle in Time comments on, I would say. One of the things that people who write classic children's books manage to do is that they make things specific enough and yet they make them simple and universal enough so that the mind of the reader can enter in and fill in the blanks. So the question of why has it survived I mean, it's, it's a very well-realized world, but we, we Hope and I were talking, there's not much description in there. You know, there's a lot of dialogue, but there's not much sub description. And when there's not much description, you don't have a haircut that doesn't work. You don't have other kinds of things that don't work. The child of today can put their own 
vision on itself. I, the second time I read it, I was amazed at how well it anticipated black holes in space. I mean, this is a, a, a concept not at all around at the time she's writing, and yet that, thi that black thing moving through the universe, taking out stars, you know, again, it's like she's anticipating physics. But for our great Charlotte's Web, you know, all of our great books, they just have, they leave enough for the imagination of the child to enter in. And I think that's part of what she does brilliantly. Uh, just to add to that, um, there isn't a lot of description. And until the advent of cell phones and computers and that kind of thing, you were able to read the book and think, you know, this is a contemporary book. This is about my life right now. Um, now it feels more like a period piece, and I did treat it as such when I did the graphic novel. But uh, certainly when I read it, I did not know that it was however many decades old. Yeah. Um, it just felt very, very fresh and contemporary. I, oh, excuse me. I also read the novel when I was 11 or 12 and ended up reading anything with Meta Lingle's name on it once I could get my hands on it. Um, and I think it was the first time I realized that how a writer can not just entertain you, but like open up doors in your head. Um, and it became something that I myself wanted to pursue. And now I'm a paid writer. Um, so, but I guess my question was, you said earlier that um, what, what kind of writer a child is attracted to kind of uh, illustrates what they're going through in their life at that time. And I was curious about someone like me who was obsessed with Van Langle. What do you think that, what that would have said? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's funny. I mean, that's a little bit like um, saying that if you were to... Um, uh, drink a lot of tea and eat a lot of medlins, you would end up feeling like Marcel Proust. <laughs> um, I, I, I couldn't say, but um, I think you were, um, I think she had a, there was an openness to her language, which um, had the capacity to make many readers feel a kind of very personal relationship with her. And this was totally consistent with the way she lived her life. Um, before the days of festivals like this and author tours, she was on the road a hundred days out of the week, out of the year, meeting the people she wrote for. She, she thrived on that. And her idea, one of her most basic ideas was everyone has their own story to tell. And she didn't want other people to write wrinkle and time books. She wanted people to look inside themselves and write their own stories. And I think that was really the message of the openness of her own way of addressing her readers. So I think that's probably what you responded to. Yeah. And just speaking writer to writer, I think a lot of the time the things that you love are not necessarily the things that you take in, the things that come back out of you. You, you may not even know what your influences are. Like for me, I wrote several books before I thought, oh, probably Madeline Lengel's books have had a bigger influence on me than I realized. So you never know what's in there. You never know what's going to come out. It's, you'll surprise yourself. Hi. So uh, more of an observation than a question. Um, I actually brought my first and only copy of the book. Um, as this was, I grew up in a household where all the books in the house were open for all of us to read. So I think I read it by about five or six. I might be a little too much now. Um, this was actually my sister's copy. I appropriated it. It has stayed with me, and she thankfully had the entire trilogy. I've appropriated all of them. Um, my one regret from the things I've read about Madeline Lingle is that I never had a chance to meet her. It's not quite a 50-year-old copy, but it's just a little bit younger than me, so it's, it's up there. Would you talk a little bit about spirituality? When I first read this, it never occurred to me that there was anything odd or different. You know, as a kid who was raised with 12 years of Catholic school, it was part of who I was, that part of the 60s. It wasn't that long after the book was written. But 20 or 30 years later, suddenly there was this backlash against the religiousness of the book. And if you'd just talk a little bit about that. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, when the book was circulating as a manuscript around 1960, 61, 
it was rejected a great many times by well-known editors at well-known publishing houses. And one of the things that made these people um, nervous or uncomfortable was that it had a, a religious subtext. Um, you know, who were, who were the three elderly women who had these supernatural powers? Who was this Charles, the chosen child, who seemed to be of a different um, you know, uh, order of uh, being than the rest of us? And, um, and c was it proper, was it appropriate to put Jesus on the same level as Einstein and Michelangelo, you know, as the people who have hope, who offer hope to the world? Um, this was a time in America when um, school prayer was being contested and every, you know, religion in public uh, taxpayer funded um, situations like public schools was, was a real hot potato. So in the early history of this book, um, if anybody complained about it, it was that it was too religious. But at the time you're talking about in the 80s, um, there was a, many books were being uh, challenged for not being religious enough. And, Madel and Wrinkle in Time was criticized by um, Protestant fundamentalist Christians because some of these elements that she incorporated in the name of her religion didn't really conform to the fundamentalist view according to the Bible. So she kind of, she got it from both sides. And she was a very um, uh, eloquent and active um, supporter of First Amendment rights. And by the mid 80s, the period you're talking about was the president of the Authors Guild, which meant that she was a national spokesman for um, authors right to tell the story they want to tell. And she and Judy Bloom, who was also, you know, savagely attacked um, by censors, um, went, to, went around the country together uh, defending not only their personal rights, but the rights of all Americans to speak their minds. Yeah, I think one of the things we didn't talk about, but is so much a part of this book, this is one of the most challenged books. Um, since the 19th, still is on the top 25 list, I believe, even today. It has been among the most challenged since early 1960s when it came out. And um, Madeline Lingle never backed down from it. By the way, she defended it, as Leonard said. She became a very eloquent spokesperson. But yeah, she got attacked from the left and she got attacked from the right. And um, she stood by her book and her right to tell this story with whatever elements she wanted to put into it. So um, there was a lot of courage in her standing up for this book at, at different points in time. Along those same lines, uh, I was wondering when the book came out, how was it marketed? What was the idea? Because you guys have spoke of it as a, uh, a youth book. And I, I've always thought of it as what has children as characters, but I thought of it as somewhere between Ray Bradbury, C.S. Lewis, something that is a, approachable for youth, but isn't really a youth book, a, as many of you have talked about reading it as an adult and really enjoying it. I mean, it, uh, is it because it's so good? Is that why you don't see it as a youth book? I mean, that just feels a little prejudiced against youth books. I guess the question behind it all is, what, what is youth literature? That's a question. Yeah, we won't go near we won't, I won't go near that. We can, Leonard and I can do history for you. Um, it was, uh, Leonard can tell really the story. It was rejected by everybody, eventually picked up by Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. Um, we believe around 1,500 copies were printed. It was a v under 2,000, very small print run. And um, they once admitted that their um, marketing plan was that it would be sold to Madeline Lingle's mother's friends. Okay, they didn't think anyone would necessarily buy it, but they were so taken by this story, which had, you know, was so different from anything, and so they published it. But you have to understand, it won the, the top children's award, which is the Newbery Award for children's books. The reviews were glorious, and they said, this is for the thoughtful child. This will be a great book for the child. So it was certainly um, done as the idea that initially this was a young people's book. I think it's moved up in age, but it was initially for the young. Yeah. Leonard. And of course, um, Madeline Lengel, depending on her mood, um, sometimes would bristle at the suggestion that she wrote children's books. 
she would say, I write for um, the, you know, whoever wants to read my books, and they sometimes just happen to be about young characters. And then pressed for why she wrote about young characters, she would say, well, children still have an open mind, you know. But I think she, uh, you know, deep down understood that um, the children were part of her core audience in any case. But the, the editor who accepted the book was not a children's book editor. He was a very high uh, literary editor. And I found a letter recently at the New York Public Library written, to that, uh, written by that editor to someone who had been on his staff working on publicity for the children's books that Farrar Strauss published. And he thanked her for having um, bugged her so much, telling him to pay more, to take children's books more seriously because only because of that w did he think he was prepared when the manuscript for Wrinkle in Time came into the house to recognize uh, its value and to see really what it was. Yeah, so you raise a very good question and there's no black and white answer really. You know, the ideal book can be read by a wide range of people over our lifetimes. Yeah. Okay, I fear they're going to tesseract us out of here, all right? Um, we have to move to the next dimension. If you have more questions, um, we'll be out there. Um, we'll be in the autographing tent. Thank you very much, and thank you for this wonderful celebration of Wrinkle and Tom. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.